Um, so you, you, you have a, a fantastic uh, blog um, and there's like plenty of, of really interesting things for like anyone that, um, you know, uh, as, as, as a lot of people in the audience loves data, loves the machine learning, loves the learning about that space. Uh, it's it's uh, definitely highly, highly recommended. Um, you, al you also have a Discord group, right? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. um, so I'm teaching machine learning system design at Stanford. So it's mostly about machine learning in productions. Uh, so one thing I have noticed is that um, um, a lot of uh, a lot of, a lot of materials about machine learning online is tutorials approach, which is great. So you see like here, here's a tool, you just follow this step, follow this notebook and you can get up and running, which I think is great for people to get uh, into machine learning. And I benefit like a lot from it when I started out. Uh, however, as I started building more and more system at a uh, scale, I wanted to be more reliable, more maintainable. Um, I realized it's like we need more of a um, systematic, systematic approach to it. We can just like, take a bunch of tutorials and put them together and hope that things work. So I think, so my, my course is about having a more systematic approach to machine learning in productions. So you, you don't, you don't just like, um, yeah, so you just like get a bunch of tools, but usually think about those, uh, those, um, the machine learning system in, as in what do you want to use it for? How do you want it behavior to be? And uh, what are some of the design challenges you have to face? And what happened if you like follow each of the, of the design, design decision? And what, what does that um, mean, uh, machine learning design? Uh, <laughs> so um, it's, it's an interesting question. So, so I think design is like one of the fancy word. Uh, so I think it's just like, it's a course on how to bring machine learning to productions. And design is you think of like more architectural choice. So first of all, you want to know what weather or systems going to do predictions. Um, online or, or in batch or um, well, whether you want to use um, REST, uh, um, request driven like REST API or you want to stream uh, event driven API. So a lot of uh, a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. And so talk about the engineering, different data format. Uh, I think uh, I was I really enjoying the, uh, the discussion with Jack on the engineering at, uh, at Reddit. So we did have a, a couple of lectures on data engineering. So it's just like help students understand uh, different data format, uh, trade-offs of, of for some like, uh, column-based, row-based data format, like text-based, binary, and um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and um, is the overarching idea of, of design is, is to be very opinionated about a certain way of doing things, or, or, or when you teach it, uh, do you present it as, this is like a you know, series of, 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 of tools and as long as you have, have an, uh, an idea about what you want to do, like everything can work. Okay, well, I guess what, what are the, uh, the, the key opinions you have on machine learning design? So, uh, so the main idea is to go backward from the, the problems. So I think a lot of people approach machine learning as like you start with the solutions and they try to like five problems where machine learning can like be applied. So, and it's like, so tend to be like, oh, hey, this is fancy model coming out like bird or, or whatsoever. And then let's try to like, see, like, um, let us try to run it and see like whether it help us. And I think it's just like, it's, it's very interesting like, in R&D, but I think it's just like a wrong approach when you try to solve actual problems. So it was like trying to encourage my students to like look at the problems, like what problems is this? Like what is the easiest, simplest solutions? And it doesn't have to be machine learning. It can be like non-machine learning or, or if it's machine learning, it can be like very simple models. Uh, and, and then from there you can, so at least you have some baseline and then you can uh, touch on more complex models for, uh, for the solutions. So, so it's I'm, a lot about like best practices. Um, yeah. That's great. So an, another part of your work has been um, to survey the landscape of machine learning uh, tools. And you, you've written a lot about, uh, about that. H how many frameworks and tools have you found so far? Oh, I think that's, that's is, uh, actually not the core of my work. I think it's just for natural interest. I just want to see, so I like playing with new tools. So whenever something coming out, I really want to see, like, look at it, like, look at the GitHub charge, like, clone it and see, like, what I can, uh, can do. I think, I guess that's my approach is, like, uh, 
look at solutions and try to find a problem for it. It's just like I want to see where they have solved my problem. So, and and I was a snuggle um, right before I just left snuggle recently, which is very sad. And he was on laughing. I'm not actually not that happy. I'm not happy about it. Um, so, so, so when we're at a startup, you just need to like give an eye out for, for what is out there. Snuggle is, is a great tool and anything like is one of the, like uh, one of the better ML startups out there. Uh, but you know that when you're, when you're doing a startup, you can't just like close your eyes, you know, you always have to give an eye out for, for what is out there so i have been um just like um keeping track of different tools that i find uh that i found and i think the last version has about 284 it was supposed to be almost 300 and then a few of them died between like december uh and, like december like two years ago and now december last year so yeah and um what have you uh learned about the evolution of the landscape over time it's, it's very interesting. So I was looking at it and I think we was trying to, to look at the year each of the tool was uh, made, made the first comment if it was uh, open source or if it was a company was looking at when it was incorporated. And I was, uh, so it was trying to divide the tools into different categories based on the problem it was trying to tackle. Um, and I think there was um, this like a pre uh, deep learning phase like before AlexNet in 2012. So it was a lot of uh, traditional older like framework with, with a lot of cool thing like uh, addition tree and, and stuff like that. And then after deep learning, there was uh, this phase, this explosions of uh, deep learning framework. Um, and 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 then from my uh, 2016, uh, I think um, I think Google has. Um, um, okay, my phone is just like wake up because when I say Google, my phone is like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so so whenever you um, so so after, from in 2016, I think Google has this article out about how they use a deep learning for for Google Translate. And I think it was one of the or one of the first. Um, one of the first use case of like deep learning in productions. And I think that from then there was an explosion of, of companies like trying to use deep learning, deep learning in their, in their, uh, in, uh, in their products. And we have seen a lot more tools around like bringing machine learning to production. So less framework. So I think by 2017, in 2018, there's pretty much the competition is between like PyTorch and, and TensorFlow. Uh, before then it was just so, so many more. Uh, so from 2016, yeah, uh, a lot about like serving, a lot about, um, uh, model evaluations, uh, yeah. So, like on on the surrounding of um, of machine learning, and not just model building. But you were also saying somewhere in your writing that um, you felt that the landscape was still underdeveloped. Um, I think it's very interesting. So, I think one thing like this is both overdeveloped and underdeveloped. So it's very crowded, but it's still underdeveloped. So mm -hmm. I think um, I think my theory is that um, I, I think it can be totally wrong and I would love to hear the, or the thought on it. So my theory is that um, a lot of people are trying to pluck low hanging fruit right now. So there are a lot of low hanging fruit tools and they are like very similar, uh, but they are like a lot of big what's challenges. An of, what's an example of a low hanging fruit? Data, like data labeling, like how many data labeling tools out there? Like there's a lot. Um, it's not a bad thing. Uh, it, 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 it's just that, um, yeah, a lot of, um, uh, yeah, so a lot of low-hanging fruit. So like there's so many different tools. And, and the thing about uh, machine learning uh, production is that like uh, data is still the biggest like problem in, in machine learning right now. And data is like, so how to, uh, how to load data in, how to load data out. So like the in and out, like it's, 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 it's a big, big, big problem. It can cause a lot of latency and people care about it. So so companies like once you use a is that, is that, is that Is that generating the data? Is that moving the data? What, what in, in what way is it all? Um, so, so I mean about like data management. Uh, so yeah. so like you have a large data, a data, amount of data coming in, like how you can like process it very quickly, you know only where to send the data and then what to do with, with data when, once, once it's there, I think. So I think Jack was mentioning like the scale of, uh, of which like, uh, already got their data and it was like a lot right yeah. so that part that party is 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 um there's a lot of low-hanging fruits what what uh where do you see the underdeveloped part of the landscape so so there are a lot of low-hanging fruits and 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 um I, I think that a lot of low hanging fruit um, of like people come from the actual f uh, frustrations of what they have seen when they are trying to uh, build machine learning in their companies, which is great. Um, but but the problem is that is that the people are so so many people are so focused on what what is the problem right now, and they don't see what machining can be. 
I'm not sure if it makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I think like what could have been better uh, is that I think not people are trying to tackle the problems of making machine learning, like, of making machine like to use up like a lot, of, like to be a lot more useful, or, like a lot more more potential to machine learning um, compared to what how machine learning is being used right now. Mm -hmm. So I can see like oh sorry. No, no, no. So I think I think one example I think you can, can feel very excited about is um so so currently I think I wrote another post about like machine learning uh is going real time so like, I'm really excited about online machine learning so online machine learning as in machine learning that um there are two two aspects to it one is online predictions it's a system machine learning system that can make predictions in real time like when users enter a query it can just generate predictions and and online learning like a system that can learn in real time like TikTok like uh, if you open TikTok in like, just a few minutes TikTok can just like know exactly what you want and it can give you suggestions about um, what you might want to watch next is like TikTok is incredibly good at it and it's so addictive so is that online learning um, so um, so I think um, a lot of people are not using machine learning for that like a lot of them are still using like offline machine learning so you train a model and then you generate a lot of predictions like say Netflix right you open Netflix and, and you, you go to the account and you see some recommendations for what you might watch so all these recommendations actually generate offline uh, mm -hmm. So 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 you go into the Netflix and you like you play around and like you've been watching a lot of horror movie you um you might you might see like a lot of like recommendations for horror movies but actually you want to use like comedy so you might like look for comedy uh, movies you might go into like comedy category so you feel like Netflix should be able to figure out that hey you want comedy today so we give you more comedy recommendations right but they can't because they they need to wait until the next time you generate a batch of recommendations for mm -hmm. you to get it so i just see like there is so much of like limitation to existing machine learning systems that's fascinating and, and the the is a reason why tiktok is able to do that while while netflix not able to uh, i mean obviously there's the the the, the frequency uh, what you just mentioned one of that being batch the other one happening in almost real time but uh, is that is that a is it also like a, a different algorithm, like a different stack? Is it uh, like a completely different set of tools to be able to do that, or, or 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 does some of it come from the you know the 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 very nature of the of the media property? Um, so this is a good question. So so they make questions of like why are companies not doing that? So yeah. one question is so so I talked to a lot of people and asked people like why why don't you do it? And they were like why should we make predictions online because like, there's no point in doing it like and doing batch predictions and it's totally fine so 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 um here's a one way of doing things and here's another way of doing thing and the other way of doing thing like my change the way you like uh set up so infrastructure and it's just like you have never tried before and it's just like and, and you've never tried before, so you don't know what boost performance boost you can get because you have nothing to compare with. So you might be very tempted to just like stay the other way. Um, so you're talking about like what can be, um, what, what makes it hard. Uh, so like there's several reasons that makes online predictions hard. I'm just talking about online predictions right now and not even online learning yet. So online prediction is still the easy part. Online learning is like really hard. Um, so um, so there's several reasons like to do online <laughs> predictions. Huh? Could you describe what online learning is for, 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 the, uh, for the audience? Um, so online learning is um, you so so you have a so currently when you when you take a machine learning course uh, you do learning offline learning you do learning in batch so you collect a lot of data and then you train a model and then you deploy the model and the model is not updated until the next time you train the model offline. Um, and online learning is when you have like incoming uh, data and you you keep on updating the data to make it adaptive to the incoming data samples. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. So yeah, so I was talking about like online uh, online predictions. Uh, so so why how is this hard? Um, so to do online predictions, you actually need uh, two components. So the first component is you 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 want a model to make predictions very fast, like fast inference, say low latency. So um, so for example, like if you, you don't want to like open Netflix and the web page load for like a minute and to show you recommendations. So so for so maybe like uh, for, for certain system it can be very slow and, and 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 companies don't want to make users wait. So they generate on predictions in the some like offline and whenever users like have a query, they fetch a query because the time it takes to fetch a query is much, much faster than the time it takes for the models to generate the recommended like predictions right on the spot. I'm not sure it makes sense. Yeah. It, it's hard to like, explain like without uh without whiteboard or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, so so like uh, currently machine learning models are getting like, bigger and bigger. So which which means like um, in general, I'm I'm not I'm not saying like all the cases, but like uh, in general, when when the models get bigger and so get more parameters, the time it takes for the models to make predictions takes longer, and people are getting very impatient. So there are a lot of like technology has been like trying to develop to make it uh, to to allow you to make uh, predictions to to allow models to do inference a lot faster. So like with the model compressions, uh, distillations, um, you can have inference optimizations like TensorRT, you can still like build hard, like uh, much more powerful software. Like you can um, like either like um, have uh, bigger, like better servers, like some AWS, you get bigger like GPUs and stuff, or we can have like um, a more powerful edge devices or like um, or chips that can be optimized for certain uh, machine learning architectures. So so that's that's, uh, that's one thing. And another is that you want all your infrastructure to be handled to data, be able to handle data coming in real time. So 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 you might have to change from the way you process data in batch into the way like into you process data uh, in streams. Mm -hmm. And we have materialized, ma materialized right after, after this. We're going to talk yeah. about streaming and uh, all the things. I'm really uh, excited for, for Arjun talk uh, after this. And, uh, and uh, Jack, uh, Jack Henlon, uh, who just uh, spoke uh, uh, in the comments, says uh, Jip, uh, Chip is so on point here. Online learning is much harder, can confirm as we're getting into more and more of it as, as Reddit. Yeah, so like online learning is like interesting. So like uh, online learning is hard. Like they both, uh, I think like online learning is hard in like theoretical guarantee because online learning is just so different from what you think of as like offline learning. So offline learning, uh, if you have, you, I'm not sure you have you taken any like machine learning course, like the way they teach you how to do machine learning. Yeah, I, I have, but I get be embarrassed uh, to say. <laughs> No, I think it's like so. So when we take a machine learning course, uh, they so they would be like, uh, yeah, to tr change a model until train a model uh, multiple epochs until convergence. So uh, so so that's what you learn by machine learning, like how, how you train a model. But the thing about when you do online learning, right? You you, you don't have you you. You, um, so convergence means that you assume that there's some stationary distribution. Just the models are converge to, but um. But uh, in online learning, so the point of online learning is you have you have the models adapt to the change in changing data, the change in distribution. So there's nothing stationary or static to converge to. So the concept of conversion is like very weird in online learning, and and second, um, you don't have a multiple epochs. Like you 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 train the you the model like sees each data point at, at most once. So 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 it's, it's weird. But I do believe that, like, if you do, if you set up the infrastructure right, um, online learning and offline learning are just like parameters to tune. So, like in offline learning, you can say like here train the model like, each step of like a uh, thousand, ten thousand um, data samples. In online learning, you can say like here train the model on like a sample or like a hundred samples. So it's just a matter of uh, it's just a hyper hyper parameter to to tune to set. But People are not at that point yet. Uh, we don't have tools for it yet, and I see very, very, very little tools focusing on it because most people are like targeting on, focusing on low hanging fruit. Hmm. Very yeah. Yeah. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, on, on, and I'd love to talk about um, something else you've, you've covered that I find really interesting, which is um, uh, how trends. Uh, diverge between the the east and the west and specifically china uh, when it comes to uh, machine learning and data infrastructure yeah so this is a really interesting question is some things that i have been trying to understand more recently and i think it's what one thing is like is it's hard because uh, i don't i don't speak uh, i don't speak mandarin or cantonese so i think it's just make it a lot, a lot harder so i have noticed uh something is that when i was looking into online learning and i realized it's like um on the examples i found were by chinese companies and it could be uh, i think i've heard uh, some American companies doing that, but they are doing it much smaller scale, like a, a lot less complex models than, than say, completely Alibaba or ByteDance uh, are doing. So, um, so I, I'm not quite sure why. So I have the, uh, so I was talking to a few more, um, uh, for a few more engineers in uh, working for like Chinese companies, and it seems like they also have a like, different set of open source. Um, than than from the from than from um, than from like what we are used to in, in the U.S. And do you know where that open source 
lives. I mean, clearly not on GitHub. Where, where, uh... I think it's, it's on GitHub. So, oh, uh, yeah. So, so I, I think so. So, for example, Kubernetes, there's just actually a different version in in China. I think I need to like think of my so my my my, uh, my brain is like not um it's a big clock right now. But I will look it up. Um, I can share share with you when <laughs> when I look it up. Uh, so I think what one one thing that happens is that um because of the language barrier. So so when so for 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 our open source culture, right? Uh, people use English. So when you use an open source, you want to contribute back. Uh, you have to submit the the PR in in English, and you have to like work with like you might get feedback and review, and then you you try to read again and you merge. And I think a lot of Chinese engineers find that is a big uh is is, is a big barrier, because it's just like are not familiar with um with that, and also um. A lot of, uh, and another reason I see as a divergence is because of the maturity of adoptions um, and also in legacy systems. So a lot of American, American internet companies are like a lot older than the average, like the new uh, like Chinese internet company. So it means that like American internet companies have a legacy system that built from like 20 years ago. And this is have to build the system on top of it. Whereas in the Chinese company are very young, they can just like build a system from scratch. So they're more willing to just jump straight to online learning instead of having to build on top of the bad learning system whatsoever that American internet companies have. Hmm. All right, so as we as we get close to uh, the end of um, allocated time here, uh, a couple of questions from uh, the, the group. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Rachel asks, uh, which is the better path towards online learning? Adapting infrastructure to train DNN in an online way or uh, different traditional algorithms like Bendit's? Um, I think it's, it's a really interesting question. Uh, so I think it really depends on, on the use case and, and the data. So, um, I think a lot of um, of companies that I see when when they try to do online learning, they they try to start with like a simple a simpler a simpler use case. But I have seen that people who try to like start with sim uh, simpler use case and so run into the same problem as people who who try to start with more complex use case. So um, I think I'm like way off my depth here because I haven't been able to like build a online like learning system myself. Um, so. Okay, sounds uh, yeah. good. Uh, and uh, let's see one more. Um, uh, what are some applications that are leveraging online learning today, e.g. recommendation systems for e-commerce? And how is this implemented on device or cloud? Oh, so I think it's a, it's a great question. So I was applications of uh, leverage online learning. Um, so I think the, one of the biggest ones is, is uh, like the easiest one to see is definitely um, uh, recommendations. Uh, so TikTok is uh, one of the like um, the biggest example for this. Uh, like you, like people attentions online. Like what what we are interested in online. Like changes like second to second. First of all, it's just like you went online thinking you could you could watch a lecture on machine learning and then you read some news about like octopus punching a fish. And like okay, now I want to squash a video of octopus punching a fish. Mm -hmm. So it's just like our attention yeah. online changed very quickly. Yeah. It happens to me all the time. Um, so, 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 so that's, that's one of the use case when you want to like learn and adapt to user um, preference very quickly and then make predictions as just, just what they want right now. So online recommendation system for online content and so e-commerce. Um, Another use case I think is like heavily underexplored, and I don't see a lot of companies doing it, except for a few. Like I think, um, except for very few, few big companies. So it's a customer customer service support. So right now people are trying to like reduce like um to, to make customer support more effective. So 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 when user support a customer ticket, you, you want to like classify like what what is this about and and route to correct person and just solve the problem for them. But like, how often do you send a customer support message? So I could say like for me like. I can use a lot of apps and website and I get frustrated but I don't send a message ever, maybe like once in like 20 times. Um, so at least, uh, so so I want um, to be able to like follow my, my users or customer on the apps and just like predict what they're trying to do and help them before they get so frustrated as they either leave the app or, or, 
or like send a message. I think that's a use case that I don't see uh, many people are, are doing it yet, but I think it could be very um, interesting for online learning, uh, for, for um, online prediction, yeah. Great. All right, so to end, uh, let's see one rapid fire question from me. What's your favorite uh, data book, newsletter, or podcast that you would recommend to the audience? Um, so for, for book, I think I realized this book by Martin, uh, I think Clapman, uh, Designing Data Intensive Applications, I think it's, it's really awesome. Um, uh, I think another book I think is very interesting, it's very similar to the book that Jack recommended, is called like, The Weapon of Math Destruction. It's, it's about like, how you can, like, algorithms using a large scale can bias against people at large scale. It's very interesting, it was written by mathematicians, um, and so lies the name. It's a really great pun. Um, yeah. Kathy O'Neill. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I don't listen to any podcast because I don't drive and I feel like you, you have to like have a car and drive to listen to podcasts. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but, but I'm hoping to get you on there. All right. Uh, very good. On this note, uh, Chip, thank you so much. This was uh, uh, fascinating and, and, and uh, learned a lot. So thank you very much for, for dropping that. Really appreciate yeah, thank, thank, thank you for having me. Uh, I think this is... Some, some questions there and uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on uh, email as well, um, my website. So like, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.